Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Vetsco Global Export Education Program. Uh, happy to see uh, the numbers increasing as we're we're getting ready for what is uh, our second component, Session Five: Basics to Export Documentation. Folks, we have a we have great speakers, experienced. They they understand all. They've seen it all. And if they haven't, they'll they'll still tell you how how to kind of maneuver when it comes to export documentations. Uh, it is such an important topic, um, and we do have a lot to get through. So I sort of want to just welcome everybody, appreciate everybody's uh, attendance, and I'll pass it over to my colleague right now, uh, Leela. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the U.S. Commercial Service, we welcome all of you to today's webinar, Expert Documentation 101. My name is Leela Orbidon. I am with the U.S. Commercial Service Office, and I will be your moderator for today. Joining us are my colleagues, Mr. Brian Beans, John Kim, and Anthony Sargis. Before we begin, I would like to share a couple of items to note. Firstly, the session will be recorded. If you object to being recorded, please disconnect now. Please ensure that your videos and speakers are off and on mute. We will provide an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. We will also take questions through the chat feature in the sidebar. Lastly, our web address has changed. Please note that all U.S. commercial service information can now be found on www.trade.gov. Again, that is www.trade.gov. I'd now like to take a minute to inform our audience about the U.S. Commercial Service. We are the trade and investment arm of the U.S. federal government, a division of the International Trade Administration. We have a global reach. Our domestic field has over 100 offices. Internationally, our offices are located within the U.S. embassies and consulates in over 70 countries. Our mission is to promote U.S. exports, protect U.S. commercial interests abroad, and facilitate foreign direct investment into the United States. Now, I would like to introduce today's speakers. First, we have Mr. Jim Trubin. Jim has over 40 years of knowledge in free trade agreements, customs compliance, logistics, and supply chain management. His experience encompasses courier, sea, air, and northern border operations. He is a regular speaker for international trade groups, including Ontario Exports and the Buffalo World Trade Association. Next, we have Mr. Robert Stein. He is the Vice President of Mohawk Global Trade Advisors. He has over 30 years of experience in customs brokerage, freight forwarding, and trade consulting. As a FTZ consultant, he has guided importers through FTZ saving analysis, feasibility studies, application, training, activation, and systems integration, as well as obtaining interim production authority approvals. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Leela. Thank you, Brian. Um, I want to welcome all the vets out there today attending. Um, as we go on, if you have questions, you know, feel free to ask. Um, and uh, Robert, uh, next slide. So why, why is export documents so important. Uh, next slide, Robert, actually. All right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, look, there's us. <laughs> Do we look younger in those pictures, Jim? <laughs> I think so. Um, this is why documentation is so important. These are standard documents we're going to go over today that's going to help you um, with your export transactions. It's going to allow you to quote your goods properly, um, export your goods, get paid. Hey, don't we want to get paid? make sure the goods are transported right and then get them cleared into that other country that you're selling to so it, it's important because you don't want to incur any additional cost you don't want to damage any sales relationships and last but not least incur any fines or penalties right robert absolutely and and let's face it it's what your documentation is what moves your cargo right everyone thinks it's the the boats and the planes and the trucks but at the end of the day, documentation moves cargo. And how many times have we seen this, Robert, back and when we go back and forth on this and customs is gone and they look at the paperwork. If the paperwork's not right, that's when they're gonna look at the shipment. So this is why you wanna get it right from the start. And so if when we look at this next slide, this is really 
what it comes down to is your documents are going to tell a story. You know, who's involved? Who's the exporter? Who's the buyer? If, if they're different than the actual importer, who's going to be the carrier? You know, what are you shipping? You know, where was it made? Where it came from? Could be two different places. So just because you are shipping steel to one country, where it was made could be a different one. And then when was it shipped? We want to know those details as well, because those are all part of determining admissibility into another country. And then how much is it worth? You know, so these little things like that are important. And then last but not least, what are the payment terms? What are the INCO terms? Oh boy, INCO terms, Robert. Jim, Jim, what are INCO terms? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and you know, without, we're, whenever you prepare documentation, you're gonna see that other terminology is gonna get we woven into the discussion. But the INCO terms, um, Robert, just to answer that question is, international commerce terms, these terms, in, um, when they're applied with a precise place that they're going to be shipped to, is going to determine whose obligations as the seller or the buyer is going to do something. Right. Uh, it, it talks It talks about who pays for stuff. It also talks about that risk of loss or damage to the cargo. So they're, they're really, really important. So if you haven't heard of INCO terms, certainly that's something you definitely want to brush up on because I think Jim and I would both agree they are foundational in your transaction. Exactly. So next slide. So this is the only eye chart you guys are going to see today. We're actually going to drill down and look at how to prepare these documents as we go on. But these are the most common commercial documents. They're going to be used to quote your goods, make sure you get paid, export your goods, transport those goods, and they need to be clear and precise. And there are a lot of other documents in the transaction, but I think another way of uh, design or sort of couching this, Jim, is these are the most common documents that you're going to have to fill out, right? Because mm -hmm. um, you're going to see a lot of other documents to the transaction, but they may be documents filled out by a carrier or a lab. or um, So these are really the documents that you as a shipper are going to be concerned about. And it really starts with the pro forma invoice. So for a lot of people, you're used to seeing a commercial invoice and Jim's going to talk about commercial invoices in a little while. But the pro forma invoice is a really handy document. And in many cases, you actually have to generate it because um, it's required, for example, in many countries for import import permits. So if you need to get an import permit overseas or the buyer has to get an import permit, they're gonna need this pro forma invoice, which is just a preliminary invoice. It's usually paired with your quotation. Um, so it's not actually the invoice for payment. So that's what makes it pro forma um, and differentiates it from the commercial invoice. And there are lots of things that go on the pro forma, um, which really should follow what is um, going to show up later on your purchase order or your sales contract. So let's look a little bit at what might be on a pro forma. And so, as Jim mentioned, we try not to do eye charts, so we kind of blow things up and you can see exactly what's on there. A pro forma looks a lot like a commercial invoice. But there are some differences, and you'll notice it up at the top in the right-hand corner. There are things that talk about expires on an estimated ship date, right? And these are things that help you with the pro forma in terms of if you're offering a quote and you're basing it, for example, on an estimated ship date, these are really important things. Because for those of you who've been following the, the, the freight and logistics market right now, um, rates and space... Uh, are very challenging and you want to make sure that if you're quoting someone the cost, especially if you're doing something like including transportation costs, that you have an expiration date on your quote. You don't want to offer them a quote that they try to get it, you know, six months later. Hey, remember that pro forma you sent me? I'm going to, I want to order those goods now. Well, that, that expired already. So very important on your pro forma, make sure you have your invoice number, date, an expiration of your quote, and that estimated ship date. Robert, one of the things that recently has happened, you're talking about rising transport costs, rising material costs. If you looked at the price yeah. of steel lately, there's a lot of companies that 
if they hit an open ended quote or pro forma invoice, they're going to get in a lot of trouble because material costs are just going up. Right. And if, if you've been looking at your costs and, and they're fluctuating, and a lot of them are going up right now. I agree with you, Jim. A lot of material costs are rising and, and that will come to an end at some point. But it's really important to use the pro forma as a way to define what you're offering, but also to limit its range so that you don't get stuck holding the bag on a quote that really is no longer in effect. Okay. You also want to make sure you include your shipment info. So, Jim, you mentioned this, you know, it briefly in the introduction, um, but this is really important too. So, the terms of payment. So, when we talk about that, we're talking about is this going to be cash in advance? Are you going to give them terms? Um, which, you know, that can be scary giving credit terms to someone overseas, but maybe you have an arrangement where you give them, you know, net 20 or net 10 or net 30, or maybe you're using a letter of credit because you're dealing with a buyer who you just don't really know and you're trying to protect your interest. And that letter of credit provides you with some security to make sure that you'll get paid through the bank. So if you're not familiar with letters of credit, that's a whole nother hour and a half we could talk about, right, Jim? Um, <laughs> but but if you're not if you're not already uh, familiar with them, certainly as a, as an exporter, you'd want to know how they work and when they might be useful. Um, so your terms of payment, your terms of sale. So there's those Enco terms. This one is um, uh, carriage uh, insurance paid to. Uh, which means that that named place there, my French is terrible, so I am not going to pronounce that. But that's where the carriage is paid to, Jim, whatever that says there. And then um, <laughs> um, the ownership, it says title transfer occurs, the ownership transfers when payment is received by seller, which I think is really interesting. Jim, why would title transfer be on here if the INCO terms are on here already? Uh, right. You're hitting a, a very important point here. The um, INCO terms, as you mentioned earlier, deal with loss for damage to the goods or, uh, you know. And the obligation. An obligation ends there with tr risk transfer on that at given delivery point where title transfer is different. You can retain title um, and it's it falls under a whole different set of laws. And that's the UN Convention of Sale of International Goods, COSIG. I'll, wow. I'll let I'll, I'll let you I'll let you get to that in a second, but but that's a really important distinction, everyone. But just remember that your INCO terms do not include title transfer. So including this on your pro forma ensures that not only will your terms of payment be clear, the INCO terms determining the risk of loss or damage to the goods, as well as the obligations for the cost of transporting them, and then also naming explicitly where the title transfer occurs. I don't think I need to explain the transportation method, but it's also good to put that in there to make sure that there's an expectation of how the goods will be delivered. If they think they're getting it air freight, and you're sending it ocean freight, your buyer is going to be pretty unhappy. So uh, let's see. This is an additional. Oh, this is the bottom of the slide. So so basically, this is the bottom of the pro forma, and this is where you put in things like your HTS code, your country of origin. And country of origin isn't like where you got the goods. <laughs> Origin is where the goods were made, and that's important because as you export the goods, you're going to have to declare whether they are foreign or domestic. So country of origin, where the goods were made, description, we're going to talk about description later, right, Jim? And, mm -hmm. uh, and then things like unit price, quantity, total. So you'll notice everything that, that you would expect to see on the commercial shipment is here, including the breakdown for packing, air freight, and insurance, as well as things like weight and dims, which are also important because they impact the cost of the freight, whoever is paying for it. And that's down at the bottom. Um, Along with all the totals, you'll notice, or you might notice, a little section called the Law and Dispute Resolution. So I'm going to highlight that and let Jim talk about his favorite topic, the UNCISG. So, Robert, we both aren't international attorneys, but this was a, a advice given by an international attorney to me in saying that it is advisable to have a resolution clause in um, on your pro forma in the event something goes wrong 
you can arbitrate in, in a given place. So in this case, depending on what state you're in, you're going to want to add that in there as well. You may want to talk to an international attorney and ask them if they want further language in there. But what this does is it binds the parties to uh, be in a court in the United States instead of overseas. I had a, a client once that forgot to put the arbitration clause in and they wound up arbitrating in Singapore and they had to hire a Singapore lawyer and they had to fly to Singapore four or five times to resolve the matter. You want to make sure that if you're going to arbitrate, you arbitrate in the United States. Great advice, Jim. Oh, and then here we just have the highlight of the air freight and we can take you now to the commercial invoice, which is the next document that you'll prepare, assuming that you get the sale. So the commercial invoice replaces the pro forma. Um, it's considered the permanent invoice that it's going to be used for all types of things from payment to export to import formalities in you know, but the one thing that's very important to keep in mind is any errors on this is going to cause delays. And and if it's inaccurate, uh, it could result in penalties or seizures. So you want to get it as precise as possible. And what we're going to do now, Robert, you can go to the next slide, is we're going to go step by step on this. And so this is so important. If you look at it, the top part, you got a seller. Obviously, you're going to spell it your name completely, the legal name of your company. But the ultimate consignee or the person that you're selling to, if it, if they're different, it'll be a different matter. But the ultimate consignee, don't abbreviate it. I had a company once that abbreviated um, the name of the company going to uh, a company in Brazil. And as it turned out, there was a, another company with that name and it didn't end well. So this is so important that you make sure that the name spelled right, that it's the full name, don't abbreviate, and and because these are gonna be important things. And sometimes it may be that the buyer is different. And this, is, this actually happened on Brazil too, where the buyer issued the PO but it was the ultimate consignee or the ship to location, Robert, was actually someone totally different. And uh, the, if the paperwork's not precise, it caused problems and it caused confusion over in Brazil. So, right. and, and, I, and I think this, you know, in general, Jim, I would say precision on shipping documents is really important. But especially if you get involved in letters of credit, like we mentioned earlier, lack of precision not only leads to delays, but leads to additional charges because those those discrepancies must be corrected. And of course, the bank wants their money whenever a discrepancy has to be corrected. So, so Robert, you know, if we were talking among friends here, the one thing I would give everybody as advice is send off that commercial invoice, not just to the buyer, but to your freight forwarder and have them approve the document. They're going to look at it and see if there's something missing. I, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, a key step that will prevent a lot of heartache for somebody. Totally agree. So, as you can see, again, we're we're pretty much taking that same information we had on the pro forma, and and giving that information on inco terms on. Um, the name place on the inco term what how what was the terms of sale what was the sale currency of sale you know i i've had this happen where goods were going from the us to canada or us to australia they have australian dollars they have canadian dollars they have us dollars which one is it right and and if you ever hear yourself uttering these words it's a huge red flag and here are the words they should know, okay? Those are words that will always cost you lots of money. Don't leave it for anyone to guess or interpret. Be complete, be specific, and you won't have disputes later on about what kind of dollars are they? When was the money due? 
Where were you paying the freight to? That, that is all spelled out right here on the commercial invoice, which mirrors what you spelled out on your pro forma. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Okay. So the next slide, it talks about the number of pieces. It talks about the gross weight. It talks about cubic meters. If you don't know the cubic meters, but you know the, the actual dimensions of the cartons, that, that'll work as well. Yeah, your, you your, at, your forwarder yeah. should be able to convert that for you. <laughs> oh, easy enough. So marks and numbers, Robert, th this seems to always conf cause confusion. This is what you're actually putting on the actual carton or packing crate. Right. You know, so there might be two cartons, one of one, two of two. In case they get misplaced, they can locate them and put them back together. If there's a PO number, show it. If there's country of origin requirement, indicate that on the carton as well. And, and those carton numbers, those are crucial because especially as you mark stuff down on your packing list, if you do get a customs exam, many customs authorities want to look at one specific item. And if they can locate the one carton with the one item, it's way less uh, disruptive to your shipment if they open one carton than if they open 100 cartons trying to find the one item. And they're never um, as gentle opening the boxes that than you and I would be. Did anybody see the movie Ace Ventura? <laughs> that's that's how they treat your boxes. <laughs> oh. Um, so, so, yeah. This, yeah, go this ahead. Is, this is me. Um, so, so this is a really, really important part of your uh, commercial invoice, right? Your see the title up top. It says complete and accurate commodity description. And it says including model serial number ECCN, that's that export commodity control number, um, and the USML, which is the US is at the military list. Mm -hmm. So what you have here is a complete description, um, and that includes not just the model number, but what it is. So we're going to talk a little bit more about, about how to be specific, but this is an example of a really good description. It is, for lack of a better word, descriptive. Um, we know what model it is, we know what it is, what it does, what it's for, what serial number it has. There's the Schedule B number and the ECCN, which is the, the Export Commodity Control number, which defines what it is for export control purposes. Um, but there is, uh, that's not on this slide, um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is, this is a really good um, description. And the serial number is an important piece. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we'll talk about the complete description telling a story. So you said in the beginning, Jim, that your documentation tells a story. Well, your, your complete description tells a story. So we start with a bad example. So we could have a GBE1250LH. Jim, what is that? I don't know, and neither would customs. Right. So you can't tell what something is just by putting a model number. Now you could go with a generic description. You could say this is a LAN or ADP automatic data processing part, right? Um, that's better. It's a little more descriptive, but what would be best is if you actually described the part. So an optical transceiver for a LAN ADP system, but the the serial number is also a really important part here and jim why don't you talk a little bit about what is so important about that serial number so many many cases there's with an optical transceiver with a, a computer with a machine there'll be a serial number if the goods are subject to export control and they may be exported under a license you would need to know that serial number the other reason why we'd want to know the serial number is if it's under a warranty program of some sort, it's going to go back and forth for repair at some point. That way, when it's being brought back to the U.S. and when it's being exported back to that country, they can prove that it was under warranty and they would have, have to pay maybe only on the repair then. Right. And there's one other thing, that, and it goes beyond the compliance aspect. And that is what I always refer to as the gray market, right? If you put your serial numbers on your export documents 
And then somewhere down the road, someone in the U.S. says, hey, I've got this item. I want to send it in for warranty repair. And they give you the serial number and it matches something that you exported. That's something that shouldn't be in the U.S., right? That's something that was exported and belongs somewhere else. So how it got in the U.S. is something you may want to look into. Robert, you know, we, we talk about descriptions and how important they are. What if you have a machine, you know, and you're going to export a machine, you know, what, what would you, what, what would be a good description? Because obviously sometimes these things are going to be in multiple pieces, right? Right. So you have a big, long list of components, right? And you're trying to figure out how to describe everything. And I would describe it as one knockdown machine whatever it is, whatever its function is, whatever it does. Um, I wouldn't try to describe it as all of its components. I would describe it as a knockdown finished machine. And, and it'll eliminate confusion with export customs and import customs. It, yep. it definitely will. I agree. Excellent. Well, of course, the phone has to ring in the background, so it's probably customs calling now. Um, <laughs> so let's go to this next slide here. Um, so what we want to point out here is you have your schedule b number on here really important to include the classification um, uh, obviously we're going to talk about a shipper's letter of instruction as well but having this on all of your documents is really important as well as the terms of sale and originally our example for this terms of sale it showed irrevocable letter of credit so if this was on an irrevocable letter of credit Jim, what's missing from here? Uh, the letter of credit number, which is That's really what, important. It's absolutely. a requirement. It's a requirement. It should be on your commercial invoice. So if you are using letters of credit and they are frequently used for export sales, so it, 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 many of you may be already experiencing it or looking into it. But if that's the case, your, your documentary credit number um, should be right on here with the date of issue. And it should show up not only on your commercial invoice, but it should be on your bill of lading, your packing list, all of your documents. Rob, Robert, I was going to make one point here too. So Schedule B is the export classification for the goods under AES to export your goods. Every once in a while, it's only harmonized for the first six digits. There is cases where on a case by case basis, Robert, you're just going to have to delete that from the invoice for the overseas party because it just causes confusion for them. Right. Uh, I, I don't in, know if you've seen that, but I've seen that. Yep. Yeah. In some cases, deleting the last four digits eliminates the confusion. In some cases, we've just had to delete the whole thing because it's causing heartburn for the the import on the other side. And and removing it is not wrong. We prefer to see it on there. Um, certainly you're going to provide that schedule B number to the filer of your AES. So when the automated export system filing is done, if you're, if your forwarder is doing it, if you're doing it yourself, um, but uh, if it's going to someone outside, you're still going to specify it on the shipper's letter of instruction. Um, but in that case, if you're, if your buyer is saying, look, customs has given us a real you know hard time here because that 9540 on the end isn't, isn't correct over here. You can remove the whole thing. You can remove the last four digits. You can accommodate that. We like it on there because that's best practices. But the practical reality is there are situations where you might have to remove it. And just like on the pro forma, you see the breakdown, right? So now we have it broken down. We have our packing costs. We have our freight costs, insurance costs. So all these things that um, could potentially have an impact on the dutiable value overseas. So your, your buyer will be keenly interested in seeing you break out this these costs in many cases because they may not want to pay duty on the $14,779.87. There may be opportunities where some of these might be what we call non-dutiable charges. Now, we're not going to take a deep dive into that here, but certainly where your buyer says, look, I really need you to put the freight costs on the invoice because I don't want to pay duty on it. It's certainly very helpful if you've included freight charges in your invoice price to be able to, to show that as a separate charge. All right. So, Robert, why don't you hit the slide one second? I think I'm going to, yep. So, back 
November 15, 2016, so we're coming up on five years, they finally harmonized the two control statements that the U.S. government used. One we used to have for state or ITAR goods and one for the EAR goods under the BIS. And they finally came up with one statement. And this this is good bo boilerplate. So you could say my goods are EAR 99. I don't need to have a destination control statement on. But it's advisable that you have this on there anyways, because it, it's a warning to overseas parties that um, the goods, if they're going to be resold or transferred or exported to another country, that the, this this statement's on there. It's good boilerplate. Now, so hit the next. And, and I'll, I'll just mention real fast, you know, a lot of times you're selling to people overseas and they don't necessarily understand that they're receiving goods that while they're maybe they are EAR 99, um, they they could possibly if things change, there could be uh, some things that are they are restricted from doing. Plus, nobody overseas is allowed to take U.S. goods and send them to places like, you know, Iran. <laughs> um, so so it's really important to put that in there to protect yourself. Exactly. The, the other part of this is that there should be some type of a true and correct statement on your commercial invoice. I know this one's a little wordier than some. I've seen some that are just saying we hereby certified that this invoice is true and correct. The reason they do this, Robert, is that there's some countries where people um, um, undervalue the goods. And, no, and, and, that doesn't happen. Come on, Jim. <laughs> so in a situation like this, this is so critical that there, Customs is alerted that this is the true and correct invoice. The other thing here, too, is there's a signature spot on your invoice. And so, you know, do you need to sign your invoices or not? Yes, my answer is yes. And the reason I say this, and it should be in blue pen. Blue pen shows it's an original signature. Um, certain countries require an original invoice in blue pen. Other countries don't. It's easier just to remember to, to have blue pens on hand in the shipping department or customer service department and sign the invoices in blue pen than to remember which countries don't have it that requirement and which ones do. Uh, it's just an easy thing to remember. Jim, I've been in this business over 30 years now. Do you know when the last time I bought a pen that was other than blue ink was? <laughs> I bet you know. Yep. Over over 30 years ago. Because when you're signing documents, I learned from the first day in this business, in this international business, blue ink just clearly sets apart signatures. You know, I mean, a black ink signature, tough to tell, original or not. Did you really sign it? Did someone copy and paste a signature from another document? And these days with color print and, and you know, editing software, you can do almost anything. But it's just ingrained in me. And of course, customs told me I should never own a red pen. So we won't even go there. <laughs> exactly. So packing list. Packing list is so important. You know, one, obviously, it should be more detailed than a domestic packing list. But it serves three important functions. One of them, it's going to be used for export exams and import exams. It's, it's going to be used to, um, you know, also receive the goods. So, so, Robert, I send these goods to you. You receive them in your warehouse. You're going to be able to take this packing list and check off to make sure you got everything on that shipment. And third one, Heaven forbid you have to go through this. If you have to put in a claim for damage or loss to the goods, then you would need a packing list. And by the way, the packing list serves as a wonderful double check for your commercial invoice. I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone who is getting ready to ship goods and at the last minute they decide to throw something on the invoice and they don't update the packing list. And it's immediately apparent there's a discrepancy between the commercial invoice and the packing list. So the packing list uh, serves as a double check to confirm that everything is on the packing list that's on the invoice. And more importantly, sometimes we'll see people update the packing list and not update the commercial invoice. 
And that's another problem because now you have goods that are obviously being shipped that have not been declared on the commercial documents. So these are things to be aware of. An overage situation like that happened for one exporter I know where they sent something over to Ukraine and it got there and the, everything said 11 pieces. Uh, unfortunately, it was 13 and they had to figure out what happened. So, so this is so important. The other thing, Robert, we talked about this earlier, serial numbers. If you have serial numbers, show them in the packing list as well. Because if for some reason, let's say that one item's being returned and it's under a serial number, one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's one's under warranty, and that's the one that's in box two out of 15, that's the one that Customs Overseas is going to want to look at. See if it was repaired. This 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 document's key. If anybody needs a copy of a packing list, we can send them one. We'd be glad to. So shipper's letter instruction. This this document is one of your best friends. Okay. So even if you're selling under an Inco term called X Works FCA FOB. You still have responsibility as an exporter to make sure that you're providing the correct information under the Export Administration Regulations, also known as the EAR. And so using this shipper's letter of instruction, it's a control document. It's giving the forwarder information that's going to be valuable for them to transmit the AES. And depending on circumstances, you know, it may be the overseas parties forwarder who's going to be doing the AES filing. It may be your forwarder, but there's certain ones that we're going to look here today. We're going to talk a little bit about related parties. We're going to talk about routed export transactions, and we're also going to talk about license numbers, exemptions, and exceptions. Uh, and then we'll look at the ECCN under the U and the USML. And, oh, and I would, <laughs> and I know a lot of people who prepare documents, they hate this document. Um, because it's more technical, but I would say as a shipper, this document is your best friend because you can make sure that all the hard work you've done to make sure your goods are properly classified and are not under control. If they are under control, that they are properly licensed. All of that work is reflected here. And if you don't fill this out and give this to whoever's going to file the AES, who knows what they're going to file? And then when when some problem occurs, they're going to point back at you and say, well, the shipper never really gave us the information we needed. So this I always say this is your best friend. If you're if you're selling to someone and the goods are shipping out overseas, the SLI is your way of ensuring that your good information is what's passed to the filer. If they file the wrong information, you're covered because you gave them the right information and they chose not to file it. Exactly. So some general instructions. Uh, you know, if it's signed, this is a legal document providing power of attorney to the forwarder. So if your foreign buyer is controlling the freight and using their freight forwarder, you're going to provide the information on that shipper's letter of instruction but you're just not going to sign it. Right. Now, there are some SLIs, Jim. I've seen some that have two signatures. One is a signature that says the information is true and correct, and one is the authorization for power of attorney. If you see an SLI like that or you're using an SLI like that, it's okay to sign the true and correct line, but do not sign the authorization to that provides power of attorney. Great point. So every shipper's letter of instruction is going to be specific by spe specific to that shipment so you could have three shipments going out technically you're going to have to complete three different shippers letter of instructions because you really can't do a blanket one and then you know uh and, and robert like you said earlier signing it for the true and correct information is only providing that as a source of information for the filing purposes. You're providing them the key data elements they need to file the AES. You know, here's the one thing still. Um, when you're completing this form, you can't really 
leave blanks in because we just when we're a forwarder, we just don't know, right? You don't know it, what the answer is. Is it EAR 99? Well, we don't know. So we're going to have to go back and ask that question. So, you know, indicated as yes, no, maybe not applicable, you know, but you're going to need to complete that the whole document. And you don't want your buyer's authorized forwarder who might be filing the AES for you using this SLI. You don't want them playing a game of fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So here's one of the things that's really important. This was added to the, the shipper's letter of instruction and into the AES system back a couple of years ago. So Robert, can you, yep, awesome. So. So here's what what I do with a lot of clients when I work with them is I make sure they understand the difference. Are you selling directly to a customer who's going to take your components and use them? Are, are they going to use them to resell? Is it going to a government entity? The one I would caveat I would give you is if you're going to put other unknown, that is not good. That's a red flag for um for for uh, interested parties that are looking at the ES because they want to know if you know if you're selling directly to a reseller or a government entity and if you don't know who it, you're selling to that's going to worry the government so don't use other use one of these other ones when you're indicating the intermediate the ultimate consignee type And then indicate who the forwarder is, of course. Same thing here again. This shipper's letter instruction is going to give instructions on export compliance and export control information, but it's also going to indicate the mode of transport, how you want it shipped. Is it going air? Is it going ocean? Is it going by truck? Is it going by rail? They also want to know the INCO terms. They also need to know the state of origin. So give you an example. You may be located in Virginia, but if the goods are being exported out of the state of Michigan, that's the, the state that you need to indicate on the shipper's letter of instruction. And then, of course, the country of ultimate destination. And I have this happen quite a bit where I see shipments, Robert, they're being shipped to Hong Kong, but they're ultimately going to be sent to uh, China. So in a case like that, you need to indicate ultimate destination country is China. I just want to go back for a second on the state of origin, just in case it was a little confusing, because I think what's important is if you're located in Virginia, but the warehouse that you're shipping out of is located in Michigan, isn't that the state of origin of the of the goods then because it's being shipped out of your warehouse in Michigan? Yes, exactly. Thank, right, thanks okay. for clarifying that. Absolutely. All right, and domestic or foreign? Yeah, domestic or foreign. This is one of the more important things too. So um, I, I was working with a company and they were they were putting down domestic for everything. And they were actually going to send out a computer. And I asked them, I said, where's the computer uh, made? And they said, oh, it's made in China. I said, well, then you would indicate foreign in a situation like this. So, so this is important that you know you're descriptive. And look at again, Robert, nice clean description of the the valve. Right. Yeah, we got a 304 stainless steel uh, butterfly valve with a titanium body. Nice and clean. Be precise on these things. And then here's one of the more important things to keep in mind too. So when we look at this one, um, as you can see, we have parties are related. So the definition of a related party is the buyer and the ultimate consignee have ownership of 10% between the two parties. Um, so that would be a yes or a no. Routed export transaction, and we've kind of danced around this a little bit, Robert, <clears throat> today. When we kept talking, we said, well, if the foreign uh, buyers, freight forwarders arranging the transport, 
Uh, we mentioned that several times. Don't sign the shipper's letter instruction. Whenever the overseas parties, freight forwarders controlling the movement of the goods out of the country, it's considered a routed export transaction. I want to give that's a regulations driven uh, uh, definition. Exactly. There is one clarification here. So in the event uh, the overseas party says use our courier account and move it with this courier company, use our account on a, a collect basis. Uh, we have uh, right. We have things in writing from census that say that this would not be considered a routed export transaction because you're still controlling the movement of the freight out of the country under a, because you're using their courier account. So that is allowed. But but just so you're clear, because we talked a little bit about Enco terms earlier, Jim, and sometimes it can be very confusing if you're new to the shipping because the Enco terms will say, oh, it's your obligation as the seller to take care of the export formalities, meaning the AES filing um, for export. But the routed export transaction is something where if it is a routed export, technically according to the export administration regulations, the filing for the, um, the export filing must be done by the buyer, not the seller. So there's sometimes this um, sort of disconnect between the EAR and the and the, uh, the the Inco terms, and that's okay. We can overcome that with a written authorization from your buyer that says that you are authorized to uh, transmit the AES. So you can actually get around that little sort of hiccup in the in the the disconnect, uh, but just be aware of it because sometimes there's a lot of confusion where you say, hey, wait a second, I switched from XWorks to FCA because Jim Trubit said it was way better and I could take control of my, my export formalities. And now, and now my buyer is saying that they want their forwarder to transmit it. You're both correct because that's one of those examples under FCA Inco terms where there is that disconnect. So again, you're not gonna remember all this. This is a lot of information sort of drinking from a fire hose, but we would definitely recommend that you talk with your forwarder or with your expert um, who can give you guidance on this because this is something that Jim and I deal with every day and we understand it and we can give you good guidance. And there are lots of other people out there who can do that. Thanks, Robert. Uh, last but not least, if you do have hazardous goods, you're going to need to indicate if it's hazardous goods or not. The other ones, you know, obviously insurance is really important, but the TIB carnet and the eligible part certification, those are very specific to unique situations, and we're not going to go into detail on those. Next slide. And then if, if you look at this right now, you, you're going to be able to see that, again, we have uh, the description. It's precise. We also have in here, you know, when we look at it, we have the Schedule B number in there. We have a serial number in there. So it's the same thing we talked about earlier. Next. And then, um, okay. Nope. There we go. OK, there we go. Thanks. So in this, this is very important. So many goods, if they're not found in the commerce control list, the CCL, uh, specifically named for for a, a particular item with an ECCN number, then they would be considered EAR 99. But you have to be able to, one, know your product line and uh, did a review and document it. That would be my recommendation. And, and further to your recommendation, Jim, I would say when you get into things like trying to understand your ECCN number, whether it is a EAR 99 or not, whether it is no license required or not, you know, these are areas that are very technical and, and you should not hesitate to reach out for expert help on this because there are people who've been shipping for many years who don't understand this. Certainly, if, if this is something that you're newer to, this can be very daunting. And it's an additional area of expertise that, that certainly there are people out there that can help you. Robert, it's amazing that you bring this up because I think three times in the last 
couple of weeks, we've helped companies uh, determine their ECCN numbers, and they've actually uh, filed for something called a classification decision, a CCAD, uh, just because they weren't sure and they wanted to be precise. Yep, there's there's tools out there um, from CCATs and commodity jurisdictions. And, and again, you know, people who deal with this every day like we do, you know, we have the experience and expertise. There are other experts out there, but but we we encourage you strongly if, if this is something that you're struggling with, um, don't try to take it on by yourself, because if you make a mistake here, this is where it can be very, very painful in a follow up with commerce or state. Exactly. And, and basically, when you're filling out that form, Robert, it's taking all the information that you've determined up to this point and putting it in there for that final shipment out the door. So this is something you don't do at the last minute you do in advance. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're if you're just figuring out what the ECCN number is when you're filling out the SLI just before the goods are being picked up off your dock, that's the wrong time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So another thing that you might need to uh, obtain is a certificate of origin. Um, and this is not like the old NAFTA certificate of origin. That was something completely different. This is a document that establishes the country of origin. Uh, in many countries that you ship to, they're going to need it to qualify for reduced tariff rates because they get preferential uh, duty rates on goods coming from the US. And also in certain countries, it's just a required document. Um, it might even be required to be notarized or consularized uh, by the Chamber of Commerce. So um, it's very important to note that, there, like, for example, if you're shipping to the Middle East, that's a requirement that the notarized or consularized uh, certificate of origin. There are other times where the certificate of origin is not required. And for sure, tying back to our initial discussion, Jim, this is something that should be figured out in the beginning uh, when you're uh, trying to negotiate through the purchase order and sales contract process that is a certificate of origin required. If it is, the buyer should specify it and what type. But I think the last line on this is it's kind of like self-explanatory, but it's really important to be sure of the origin. So before you send a certificate of origin out, for approval at the Chamber of Commerce, um, remember that in most cases you're trying to show that these goods are U.S. origin. But if in fact the goods are made in China or Canada or you know Germany or Japan, um, you can't certify that they're made in the U.S. Just because you buy them in the U.S. doesn't mean they qualify for a certificate of origin. So be very careful. Robert, I was going to say that the other bit of advice is when you're asking your overseas buyer what they're going to need for documentation at the very beginning, you're going to need to determine if there's any cost for the chamber to certify this document, to get it consularized, get it legalized, because uh, there is going to be some cost to send it to the consulates to get stamped off, uh, get it back. So there's courier fees associated with that. And then you're going to have to get those goods those documents shipped overseas. So these costs you're going to want to capture in part of your process, or you know you could lose some money on the legalization part of it and on the courier costs. Yeah. So so I think you know a recurring theme as we go through these documents is remember that this process, in many cases, the documentation process is driven at the front end of the transaction. So making sure that you have good communication, we're gonna come back to this in, in the summary in the end, but we can't, Jim and I can't emphasize this enough. If you do a bad job of setting the table, dinner's gonna be terrible, um, is the best way I can put it. And, and in this case, you have a situation where you have all these documents, and if you don't spell out what the documentary requirements are, uh, ahead of time, there's going to be a lot of confusion, anguish, and finger pointing when we get to the point where the goods actually ship, arrive at destination, and now the proper documents are not available for the customs clearance. And that's the wrong time to get into a discussion with the buyer over, oh, you know, you didn't specify that, you know, that that was required. Um, so try to make sure you have these discussions when the buyer says, hey, I want to buy your goods. 
talk with them about, okay, what will you need? And let's make sure we put this in the purchase order, the sales contract to make sure that we're providing the correct documents to support the sale. It's just good customer service. USMCA certification. And for those of us who are nostalgic and older, the old, what used to be called NAFTA, right? <laughs> <laughs> so much easier to pronounce when it was NAFTA. So USMCA. So under NAFTA, those of you who were involved in shipping during the NAFTA years, there was always that NAFTA certificate. Many times it was confused with the previous form we just talked about because it was called a NAFTA certificate of origin. Um, but now under USMCA, there isn't actually a certificate that you fill out. You can, so this is a sample, I believe this is right from our website, um, and, and many, you, you can find all sorts of samples out there of different formats of a USMCA certification. In many respects, it contains pretty much the same information that a NAFTA certificate did. But the key thing is, um, when you're dealing with a shipment that might be subject to USMCA certification, so many of you may be selling goods to Mexico and Canada, Things that you need to understand is, number one, before you even offer to fill one of these out, you need to know if the goods qualify, which means they can't just be purchased in the U.S. because if they're purchased in the U.S., they could be from anywhere. And even if you make the goods, you still need to go through the qualification to ensure that you meet the rules of origin that make the goods eligible for USMCA. And again, not to beat a dead horse, but here it comes again, you need to be explicit in the purchase order and the sales contract about whether you will or you will not be providing this. I promise you, if you do not specify that you will not be providing this in your sales contract or your purchase order, when the goods arrive at the border to go to Mexico, the very first thing you're gonna hear is a phone call from someone in Mexico saying, hey, where's the USMCA certification? Um, you will definitely want to make sure it's in your purchase order and your sales contract. And, and you know, some, some of you might be saying, why are we emphasizing that? Well, a purchase order and a sales contract, they are both legal agreements between buyer and seller. That means when you come back to dispute resolution, you will have both agreed to the terms of the purchase order or the sales contract. So if you told them that there was no USMCA certification coming and they agreed to it, and now they're asking you for it, you're protected, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to provide it, make sure, again, that you're working, either you know USMCA really well, or you're working with an expert who can help you validate the claim. And if you think that just because you work for a big company that they know what they're doing, I will not mention names, but we are working with a big automotive manufacturer, and they, they know USMCA pretty well, but all of their suppliers who are regular suppliers of large quantities of parts, we have discovered that they do not know USMCA. So don't make any assumptions about people's knowledge level. Make sure you understand USMCA and only provide certification where it's appropriate. So Robert, you talked about Mexico and Canada. Canada actually has a special invoice called the Canada Customs Invoice. It's not required, but what it says in the, the D memos, which is their regulations up there, it says if the, um, the, the seller cannot provide the data elements on their commercial invoice, they can use this document instead. So, the, so it may be that there's certain cases where you're going to see this requested in in a purchase agreement or in a sales contract so you know just so everybody's familiar that canna customs invoice and it's not normally called the canna customs invoice it's usually abbreviated cci so yeah. the cci is is a much requested form so i just wanted to show everybody this one just in case yeah, and, and I think it's good to point out, Jim, that that if you agree again in your in your PO or your sales contract that you are going to provide a CCI, that you're going to have to provide it. If you don't agree to to uh, provide a CCI, the only requirement is that you have to provide all of the data elements that are on the CCI. That's what the D memo says: is 
you know, if you're not going to use a CCI, you still have to provide all the information. I don't know. I've been doing this a long time, Jim. Usually it's just way easier just to use the CCI. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. Exactly. So one of the things I wanted to talk to everybody about, and this is rather important, is so you might have goods that are considered EAR 99, low technology goods, but under certain circumstances, depending on the end use, you may need a license. And one of the requirements would be to know the the application that the goods are going to be used under. This is the official form, and it's a BIS 711 form. Most companies, and, and I'm sure you can find one out on the internet, we probably could send you one of an end use declaration. It looks very generic, but it's the same information. It's very important that companies determine the end use from the overseas party, especially, you know, in, unless it's something very benign like pencils and erasers. But if it's some type of mechanical application or certain goods going to certain countries for it could that might have um, a military a application a nuclear application or biological or chemical application and then use certificates advisable now we talked about the documents that you're going to have to fill out if you're shipping so from pro forma to commercial invoice, uh, packing list. You might uh, need to fill out uh, certificates of origin, USMCA certifications, uh, Canada customs invoice, and then end use certificates. Uh, but there's a lot of other documents that are part of exporting that you should be aware of. Now, these aren't necessarily all things that you uh, are responsible for, but you may have to be aware of them. So things like a free sales certificate, um, a health or sanitary certificate for certain types of, uh, especially if you're dealing with products that are agricultural, uh, a time or site draft, again, relating to payment, okay? A dock receipt showing that the goods were actually, uh, was it it's shipped from the dock? Um, oh, received at the dock, I, oh, I guess. The dock. Yep. Uh, other free trade agreement declarations. You have, um, a lot of times your your buyer will say they want a pre-shipment pre inspection. So there's a pre-shipment inspection certificate. There may be insurance certificates and even uh, safety data sheets. And I'm so old, I always think of them as as, as MSDS. I can't, I can't get rid of the M and the, and the SDS. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so there's a lot, and this is by no means an all-inclusive list. There are lots of documents. The longer you ship, the more documents you're going to find are part of the transaction. And, and all of these documents are perfectly fine. But again, we highly encourage you to make sure that you understand what documents will be required by the buyer and make sure that you include the list of required documents in the purchase order, the sales contract, you can, if you need to enumerate anything in, in the pro forma, you can do that too. But I prefer it in the sales contract or the PO because, again, that is the agreement between the buyer and seller. It's a legally binding agreement that if later on, if, if they didn't ask for a doc receipt and you didn't put it in your purchase order, then if they come back later and say, well, you didn't give us a doc receipt, so we can't do X, Y, and Z. And you can say, well, we would gladly provide one to you, but that was not a requirement of the purchase order. When you approved the, when you sent us the PO and we approved it, there was no demand for a doc receipt. So it's again just good customer service to get a real clear understanding. What do you need as a buyer from me, so I can make sure I can fulfill that for you. So I think this this is a good, you know, as we as we sort of get towards the end here, um, a lot of times the questions that Jim and I get pertain to like, you know, well, what are the things that that you see that that go wrong? Um, and so I'm going to cover some of these. And Jim, I know you're going to cover some of them. Um, the the most common things that we see go wrong, the name and address of the buyer and the consignee from either having incorrect information or listing the wrong party, um, listing a, a ship to as a buyer or vice versa. Um, you know, just this is something that we see a lot of. The biggest one I think we see trouble with are the INCO terms. 
Uh, and I think, honestly, that's driven by a lack of understanding by one or both parties, the buyer and the seller, as to what the correct INCO term should be. Um, so we don't have time here to go into depth, but there are certainly INCO terms rules that you as a seller would like to use or should use for maximum compliance and control of your goods. In fact, if you're using a letter of credit, you may you may really want to understand which INCO terms rules are really required in order for you to get paid. Um, so INCO terms get messed up all the time. Obviously, piece counts and weights. Uh, that happens, Jim, I think, because people say, oh, I'm going to put, you know, a thousand cartons in this container. And then they go to fill the container and there's room for three more cartons. And what do they do? They go, oh, it's, we can squeeze three more cartons in there. And they put the three cartons in, but the paperwork still says a thousand cartons. <laughs> you know, and we call that an overage. Yes. Uh, and, and customs it, calls that smuggling. Yeah. Um, and then if if it, it can go the other way, they can say, oh, we're going to ship a thousand cartons and they can go to fill the container and they can only fit 970 in there. And now you have an underage because they can't fit all thousand in there. If they don't correct the paperwork, if you count the pieces when they come out of the, the container, it's going to be 30 pieces short. So that's a very common thing. Um, we talked extensively about description of goods. I don't think we need to beat that up anymore. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, but but reason for export. So sometimes, you know, if you don't list the reason for export, it can really uh, cause a lot of confusion about how you've invoiced it. So understanding that you sold the goods or maybe the goods are being sent on consignment. Maybe this is a lease. You're leasing equipment to someone overseas to use and they're going to return it to you. Um, maybe it's a warranty repair. So all these things, uh, you know, really the reason for export should be listed and it should be correct um, so that, you know, if you return something after a warranty repair, it shouldn't be listed as a sale. All right. So that's those are the first few. And Jim, you have a few more here. Yeah, I, I got a couple here. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention too, Robert, when it came to Inco terms, make sure you're specific on the name place in on that that invoice it's gonna it'll be less confusion and if if the reason for export is no charge samples or items um use a replacement value or some type of value that's appropriate don't don't undervalue the samples that's a that's like waving a red flag at customs overseas when they see that there's two items, an electric motor above it for $60 and a, a no charge sample for a dollar. Customs is going to think that th that second item's undervalued. Yeah. Um, I was going to say on, on that on that very issue, don't be afraid to use what we call VFC, value for customs. So a lot of times the buyer says, I, I don't want you to show that I bought it for $100. I want you to show $1. And you can say, well, we can show it as a as a no charge, but the value for customs has to be the the full value. So if the value is a hundred dollars, that's the value that has to be shown. Exactly. The reason I recommend also that you show the ECCN number or the USML number on the invoice is because uh, even if the goods are sold domestically, it it's gonna allow the overseas party to know that there that there's possible controls on these goods just like the destination control statement robert it, it's it's good boilerplate it's going to advise everybody involved in the transaction that they are not going to be able to send it to re-export to another country possibly if the, that country is under sanction so that, and then last but not least, probably the most important is country of origin. So we talked about the shipper's letter of instruction having de, uh, foreign or domestic certification or statement. They, overseas party wants to know the actual country of origin of the goods. So even though it might've been a foreign good, if it's made in Japan, indicate Japan. If it's made in Germany, indicate Germany. Uh, so that's important and, and not you can't say, well, we bought it in the US, so that's why we put down US for the country of origin that that'll get you in trouble. And then probably the most important thing, Robert, I think, too, is and you said it before, and is that it's important that you have this dialogue with the overseas party 
on what they expect for documentation. And have them look at your documents before you send them. The last thing you want them to do is get over there, send originals, and then they came back and said, we need you to correct them because then it's going to cost your courier fee again. So make sure that they look at them even before you send off the first set. Right. And I think that's where if you're working with a, a good quality forwarder, you can share documents with your forwarder. And very often, especially if they're experienced with shipping to a particular market and they see you're shipping, for example, to someplace in the Middle East and they notice that you don't have a certificate of origin, they may say, well, you're shipping to such and such country in the Middle East and I don't see a certificate of origin. Is that required? Because our experience in that market is that's going to be required. Not only is it a certificate of origin, but it's required to be legalized and consularized. So that's going to take some time and some money. But if you send this shipment without it, it might get stuck in customs. So that's the value of a good forwarder is they can help guide you. Now, you know, a good forwarder might also not have experience going to the market that you're going to. So just for example, if you're shipping to Russia, um, that's a very specific market and some forwarders have extensive knowledge and others, maybe Russia is not really in their wheelhouse. So very important to understand what your forwarder really is good with and maybe where they don't necessarily have the knowledge you need. So making sure that you have the expertise on hand um, uh, at either at your forwarder or in-house to know what your obligations are. And, and I think my last comment I would make, Jim, is that on the ECCN and the USML, you know, issue, we kind of did a real high level gloss of like, you know, saying, hey, you know, you have to get the right ECCN. If you have a license, you need to make sure you have a license. I, I don't want to um, make that too minimal uh, because it's really important if you have goods that are controlled for export that require a license, uh, and some of you may have that, it's super, super important to make sure that the proper licenses are obtained. Because remember, if it's licensable, that means that you can get a license, and as long as you get the appropriate license and ship it under that license, under the conditions of that license, there's no violation. But if you ship goods that require a license without a license, even if you would have been able to easily obtain a license for them, it's still a violation and you're going to get in trouble and the penalties can be pretty severe. So again, like we've said before a couple of times, make sure you're working with someone who's expert on, on uh, uh, export controls with licensable goods. If you have ITAR goods, that's international traffic and arms regulations. Um, you know, these are like munitions and, you know, tanks and guns. All right, well, those are things that that you definitely want to make sure you have ITAR knowledge. So we've again, we've skipped over a lot of this stuff, but just to be aware of it, there's expertise out there. And if you run into those situations as you work through your documentation and you suddenly discover, oh, no, I need a license. Oh, no, my goods are covered by ITAR. There's help out there. Exactly. Robert, thanks. And and I, I think really when you look at all this, all this information, it's all the information you have that you've done your due diligence beforehand. It's just showing up on those documents. Right. And if you do good homework up front, if you get all your documentation requirements up front during the PO and, and sales contract process, the rest of this is just a matter of filling out the paperwork. There'll be no ugly surprises down the road. If you wait until it's time to ship to start organizing all your documents and filling them out, I promise you, Mistakes will be made. So, uh, let's see, where are we here? Aha, so this slide signals that um, we're gonna move to Q&A shortly, but what we'd like to do real fast, just before we tip into that, because I know we got like an extra minute here, is just talk a little bit about the challenging times we find ourselves in. We don't want people to be discouraged right now. You may have been trying to get, you know, export freight rates and availability. And and I guess the best word for the market right now, Jim, is it's challenging, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, it, you know, it, it's not impossible. You can ship goods, you can get goods moving. 
Um, but we want people to know that these are these are interesting times indeed. Uh, freight rates are high and and supply chains are a little clogged up. So people ask, you know, Jim and myself, they say, well, what's causing these delays? Why is it taking so long to move a container from one location to another? And we used to be able to say, oh, it's a shortage of containers. Oh, it's a, you know, a lack of vessels. Oh, you know, there was like a specific reason, right? For a long time, you could have said, oh, it's COVID, right? But right now, I think the problem in the supply chains is it's a little bit of everything. Jim, would you agree? Oh, yeah, totally. So so we have this odd mix of circumstances. We have port congestion. We have you know, COVID issues in the ports, we have pr production issues, we have demand, that the economy is just skyrocketing, not, a, not just in the US, but in other countries. So there's this demand for goods that is just not abating. Um, and then you have other sort of wildcard factors, like people may have heard about chip shortages, and that's impacting many industries. Um, so, so there's a lot of factors that are creating these supply chain challenges and we don't want to discourage people from shipping right now. We, we, that's definitely not the case, but, um, you definitely want to keep your ear to the ground and make your, you know, make, make use of the available resources to understand what the challenges are, what the market forecast is. You know when will when will things start to ease up? When will when will the transit times get better and the space on the vessels become more available? When will the freight rates drop? So we don't have time to go into an in-depth analysis, um, but we want you to know that if if you're finding challenges out there shipping right now, we hear you. <laughs> it, you know these well, are tough times. Robert, I'd say one bit of advice I'd give here is plan longer lead times. If yes. you know the shipment's going to move in two weeks, book it maybe three weeks out. Guarantee that you get space. That's really what it's going to come down to. Allow yourself extra time. Yeah, I I, I agree. I think uh, I've worked with a couple of co uh, companies and it's the same thing. It's, you know, you want to ship, but if you book something now, the bookings are three, four, sometimes even five weeks out. Sometimes they're a little sooner. But but it's not like it used to be like, hey, I want to ship this, you know, pick it up today and ship it out on the next vessel first, you know, like Monday of next week. Eh, not really what's happening right now. Um, so good communication with your forwarder, with your experts. Um, I think you'll find it it, it, it can be done. Um, just be patient because it's not going to nothing's going to happen as quick as it did, you know, a year ago when when a lot of stuff wasn't moving. So. Exactly. All right. With that. I know we kind of psyched out Leela there. She was ready for Q&A. She was ready to go. And then and we're like, no, 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 you can't come in yet. But uh, we, we are truly ready for question and answer. We've left enough time, I think. So we turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this is your moderator. I'm Leela. I'd like to thank the speakers for sharing such great insight and presenting them in such an engaging and accessible format. We'll now move on to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, there are already a few questions in the chat, and we would like our participants to keep submitting their questions as we go through these. Going to the first question, um, and you may have already answered some of this, but it would be great if you could elaborate a little bit more. Uh, we have a question, how can you determine ultimate country and user when you're selling to a reseller? Okay, so I got this one. The reseller in this case, unless they've indicated otherwise would the country of final destination would be the country of the resellers in and, and, you know um i i would think that depending on if the item's controlled or not i would think that they're going to want to ask more questions so it, it, let, let's say that it, it's something that's controlled i would be asking the question you know where are you selling it to you're going to need to have this discussion with them anyways because they need to know that they can't export to certain countries that are sanctioned you know you know iran sedan syria north korea you know uh, cuba and myanmar right now these are countries that you'd have to have a discussion on them with anyways and that should probably be in a distributor agreement i'm not a a customs international attorney, but this would be something that they should have a discussion with anyways. 
I, I agree. And and I think that this is what we call the re-export conundrum, because technically when you ship to a distributor who is located, for example, in Europe, there's an excellent chance if you ship to a distributor in Europe, they're going to send it to another country. And that's a re-export if the goods are U.S. So so I agree with you, Jim, that that you should have a good distributor agreement in place. They should understand the role export control plays in when they sell the goods and perhaps consulting with a good trade attorney to make sure the proper language is in your distributor agreement to protect you is the best method. Great, thank you. Um, a follow-up question. Um, what if you don't know where your item originally came from or you have multiple parts from different places? What should we do then? Okay. So, I, and I think, are the articles being incorporated in something new? Is it a new and different article? Is it substantially transformed? I think that would be the question. Maybe if they want, they can email Robert and I offline and we'd be glad to look at it in greater detail. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, while we wait for a few other questions to come through, I'll move on to one that we have prepared, um, starting with, and either of you can answer this one. In all of your years of experience, uh, what is a common mistake that exporters make when preparing export documents? And what can our participants do to avoid making those same mistakes? I'll go first on this one. I'll give you my top, my, my, my top two favorite list. Um, so uh, the first one I think I noticed, and I may have mentioned it before, is missing or incorrect INCO terms. Um, and when I say incorrect, I love when uh, sellers try to make up new terms. So uh, when I hear things like prepay and add, which you can do that, but that doesn't make sense in the world of INCO terms. Like the INCO terms actually can tell you when you're paying for the freight. They can change when you have risk of loss or damage. So when I see a prepay and add scenario or an incorrectly used INCO term, it just means that the seller doesn't really understand the INCO terms. That's maybe number one. Number two, which is a close second, is I often see that uh, sellers are trying to change their values, their descriptions, or the classifications for the buyer. So just to be clear, we talked earlier about how you can remove the Schedule B if it's creating conflict overseas, but you cannot change the Schedule B to be something else on the invoice because the buyer says, oh, I need you to change the classification so I can get a lower duty rate. I mean, there's red flags all over that statement. It's the same thing when they say, I know I bought these goods for $100,000, but can you give me an invoice for $10,000? That's a problem, right? I mean, so just to be clear, the information on your invoice should be correct, the values, the descriptions, the classifications. And when, when sellers change those because the buyer asks or in many cases demands those things be changed, it results in uh, documents that are not correct. Jim? I, I think you covered it. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I think we have a few very specific questions in the chat. Um, is it okay if you guys put your emails into the chat so our guests can contact you directly? Okay, sure. Thank you. Perfect. Um, and then I wanted to follow up on just one more question. Uh, what are some tips that you can suggest to our participants to help them navigate the exporting process from the very beginning? What is the fundamental first step for a very successful and easy process, in your opinion? I think it's just setting clear expectations at the very front of the transaction, right? So when the PO and the sales contract are being drawn up, clearly understanding what your obligations are as the seller, what the buyer's obligations are making sure that that you have a good agreement on all of the pertinent details um, in, in all of the situations that Jim and I seem to run into. They're almost always related to people who sold the goods and didn't really worry about all that stuff until it came time to actually get it off the dock. So so I think that if if you're doing a good job 
Um, you want to make sure that that you're you're clearly understanding that purchase order sales contract process. And then the other part is to get education. So attending this today is fantastic, but you should seek out as much knowledge about the exporting process as you can possibly get. Um, after 30 plus years and Jim has been doing it probably longer than I have, our knowledge is not based on the fact that we're super like Einsteinian brainiacs. We're just people that really, really studied every aspect of this business and we've spent a lot of time immersed in it. So the more you can get education, the more you can immerse yourself in the process, the more likely you're going to really learn it and, and not fall into the traps. I would think too, you, you have great resources. You don't have to go it alone. There, there's so much knowledge in the Department of Commerce to help you. You can work with your distributor. They'll tell you what's required in that market. Um, you know, understanding export controls and where your goods fall into beforehand. Like you said, Robert, learn that. There's tons of videos out there that, that even the Department of Commerce have available for people. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'll just give a minute or so to see if we have any more questions come in. Um, so, right. Leila, oh. we're we're Leila, we're going to be sending out the PowerPoint as slides, anyways, and we'll have our contact information in that. So Perfect. we'll send that 